Okay, uh, thanks very much to the organizers. This has been a wonderful <coughs> conference so far um, and looking forward to the rest of it very much. So what I'm going to be talking about today is all joint work with Dan Margalit and that's not a good sign. Um, <laughs> let's see if we can get that back up and working again. Right, which wasn't on. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's see if that works. Okay, so, right. So we've heard about mapping class groups uh, of surfaces today. So uh, just to introduce some notation, for our purposes, our surfaces are always going to be closed, connected, oriented, and obviously genus G. And uh, mod S for us is going to denote what is usually called the extended mapping class group. So the group of homeomorphisms of the surface up to isotopy. Um, and we're allowing orientation reversing homeomorphisms as well as orientation preserving. So the usual notation for that has a little plus minus, but, um, but we're just going to skip that because we're always going to be working in the extended mapping class group here. Okay. So just to, to warm up a little bit, and because it's late in the day, let's do something nice and simple. So geometric intersection number. So the main take home point of this slide is that everything in the whole talk is up to homotopy. Um, and uh, so I guess I've written isotopy here, but, but sort of the same thing in this context. So the idea is if you have two curves on your surface, uh, you want to measure not their actual intersection number, but their intersection number taken and minimized over all representatives of the same isotopy or homotopy class, okay? So if I have these two curves, A and B, they obviously intersect non-trivially, but I could just uh, homotop them off of each other and realize them disjointly, so I get intersection number zero in this case. So I'm just going to belabor this point now for the sake of not having to be belabor it 100 times further on in the talk. Right, so everything is up to homotopy. So what's the game that we play? So we're going to talk about simplicial complexes associated to surfaces in a very natural way. And we'll start with the classical complex of curves. And this is the analog of the Teats building that Andy was telling us about earlier this afternoon. So what we do is we define a flag complex where we have um, vertices corresponding to, again, isotopy classes of curves. Um, and we put edges between them if they can be realized disjointly, okay? And this defines uh, the one skeleton of the graph, and you just fill in triangles, tetrahedra, um, et cetera. So we're going to be building a lot of complexes in exactly the same way. So the basic point is vertices for isotopy classes of your object and edges between them for disjointness up to isotopy or homotopy. So here is an example of a few curves on a genus 3 surface and the subcomplex of the curve complex that they span. So, for example, I've got these four red curves here spanning a tetrahedra, so you should imagine that that tetrahedron is filled in. Um, I've got the blue curve here, which uh, intersects everything except this green curve, so it's over here with just one edge joining it to green, and green intersects three of the red curves, but not the fourth, so I've got these two edges coming out of here um, like so. And the next bit of the slide, uh, I've learned because I've given this talk in front of category theorists a lot, uh, nothing against category theorists, of course, but I often get the question afterwards, I thought there were more curves on a genus 3 surface than that. Um, so so just, you know, this is not the entire curve complex for the genus 3 surface. This is just the span of these six curves. Uh, the curve complex is locally infinite, in fact, okay? So it's this big, huge, it's not just these six dots that I've drawn here, okay? So 
<laughs> what kickstarted the work that Dan and I did that I'm going to tell you about today was a, a seminal theorem of Nikki Vonoff from uh, ooh, nearly 20 years ago now. Um, and what uh, he proved was that for most surfaces, so there are some exceptional cases um, in low genus, uh, if you look at the group of simplicial automorphisms of the complex of curves that we just defined, then what you get is the mapping class group of the surface, the extended mapping class group, okay? So what this is telling you, oh, yeah, no, I will, thanks, hang on. Okay, let's try this again. What's that? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, what was I saying? Simplicial automorphisms, big theorem of Ivanov. Um, right, so the, the whole point here is that, I mean, the curve complex is a really neat object because you can, you can explain it to somebody without a huge amount of background in mathematics. It's just like this really elementary data. You have curves, they intersect, they don't intersect, you record that information. Um, and it sort of seems like, you know, there's, there's not much going on there because uh, it's not even telling you, you know, how many times they intersect or anything like that. Um, but what this is telling you is that this object actually is entirely encoding the structure of the mapping class group and therefore the structure of everything that the mapping class group touches. So I won't go into all of that. I think we're well familiar with that. Um, and the applications um, that Ivanov had in mind was not just sort of this, this observation, but you know, you can, you can detect things about uh, what's often referred to as sort of a, a rigidity theorem for mapping class groups. So you can show that the abstract commensurator, the mapping class group, just gives you back the mapping class group. And it gives you um, a new proof of a theorem of Royden about isometries of tight molar space, okay? So, so it's not just this sort of inherent beauty that this curve complex is, is encoding the mapping class group, but there's also stuff you can learn about um, other groups and spaces that you're interested in. Okay, so Ivanov's work kick-started a whole industry, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. There's some snapshot of the industry that took place. So there are all these variations on the complex of curves. You can you know, put constraints on it, like I only wanna look at separating curves, or you can do things like um, look at uh, more complicated complexes, uh, so um, like the, the, the pants complex and things like that uh, is a little bit more complicated to define. Um, and you can, you can get analogous results for all of these complexes. So that's what a lot of the people named on this slide did for a while. And then the applications that people had in mind were looking at things like automorphism groups and abstract commensurator groups of um, the Johnson filtration, for example, I'll say more about that later, the Torelli subgroup um, and, and Bray groups and so on. So, so like I said, there was sort of a whole industry where people would just go out and they'd take their complex and try to, try to do something like what Ivanov did. So after a while, um, you know, you start to suspect there's a trend, right? And so Ivanov came back with uh, his meta conjecture. And his meta conjecture was uh, as follows. So every object naturally associated to a surface, whatever that means, and having a sufficiently rich structure has the mapping class group as its group of automorphisms. And moreover, you can prove it by reducing to his theorem. And if you look at, I mean, so all of these theorems can basically be proved that way. So if, for example, um, you know, you look at separating curves, what you do is you show that if you know what happens to separating curves, then you know what happens to non-separating curves, so you get a result for the whole curve complex and you apply Ivanov. So, so, um, so this was a natural statement for him to make. So <clears throat> the goal of uh, the work that Dan and I are doing is to resolve the meta conjecture for a wide class of complexes. And basically the point is, sort of twofold. One is just to save us all the trouble of every time we find a new complex, having to go out and reprove this theorem, but also um, some applications to some of the groups that we care about along the way. Okay, 
So here's the rough version of the theorem um, that I, I want to mainly tell you about. And all the theorems that are unattributed uh, in this talk are, are uh, with, with Dan here. So, um, so the idea is we're going to describe a set of structures on a surface that's, that's big enough to give us some room to maneuver. And I'm going to tell you precisely what all of these uh, things mean as we go. And then you have a natural map. So if you have the mapping class group and you have these structures associated to a surface, then the mapping class group is going to act on them. So for example, the curve complex, the mapping class group, so a mapping class is going to take a curve and send it to some other curve on your surface. So you always get a map here. Um, and so the question is, what properties does that map have? And so our theorem is going to tell us exactly when this map is an isomorphism by giving a nice character characterization of sufficiently rich. Okay. And uh, one of the sort of main applications that we had in mind, and I won't spend too much time talking about this, but um, so. Brides and Pettit and Soto had obtained the result that the abstract commensurator of each group in the Johnson filtration uh, is the mapping class group. And again, this is something where um, it had been done for the Torelli group um, by, by Benson and Ivanov, and it had been done uh, by, uh, for, for the Johnson kernel uh, by me and Dan and by, by Benson and Ivanov. So um, you know, this, uh, their theorem sort of gets all the terms in the Johnson filtration in one fell swoop. And so we're able to recover that result here. So, OK, so the first thing I need to tell you about is structures. What are structures? So if you're familiar with work of po uh, McCarthy and Papadopoulos, um, st structures for us are basically what they call domains. We call them regions, OK? Somehow we like that word better. So what is a region? Uh, it's a subsurface of your surface that's connected, um, compact, and um, it's going to have essential boundary components, OK? And so what we're going to do, so, so by the way, you can recover curves in this context by just using an annulus as a proxy for a curve. So, so I can talk about the curve complex and all of that. So what I'm going to do is take the set of all orbits under the action of the mapping class group of these regions. So again, just keep the curve complex in mind as you're working examples. So take annuli, take, take a non-separating annulus on the surface and let the mapping class group act so you get all non-separating annuli. Or you could take genus 1 annuli, genus 2 annuli, and so on. And you're going to take a subset. So this is going to be, this is going to be a finite set. So we take some subset. So I'm just going to name, you know, like, genus two non-separating uh, tori with one boundary component and non-separating annuli, and that's my set, okay? So again, the important thing is not just the topology of the region as a space in and of itself, but how it's embedded in the surface. For example, if it's an annulus, is it a non-separating annulus? Is it a genus one separating annulus, and so on, okay? And then we build a complex in the same way that we did for the curve complex. So we take regions, and every time I say regions here, I just mean homotopy classes under the, um, <coughs> with, with their mod s orbit in, in the set that I've chosen. And again, edges uh, go between them if they can be realized uh, disjointly. Okay? So <clears throat> we know some examples already, right? So we've been talking about one. So if I take my set A to be mapping class group orbits of all annuli on the surface, um, then I just get back the complex of curves, the familiar complex of curves. Um, <clears throat> and again, if I take separating annuli, this is mainly for the sake of introducing some notation, I get CSEP, the separating curve complex. Um, if I take the whole thing, then I get what McCarthy and Papadopoulos called the complex of domains. And um, you know, I can just start doing random stuff. Like if I have an even genus surface, uh, I could take all the separating annuli that cut it in half exactly. And in this case, I just get a discrete collection of vertices. So it's kind of a maybe not such. Is that what? 
yeah, that, that's it. It's, it's, it's the topological property, right? It's just you're, you know, you're, yeah, so you're just taking like genus, you know, a, a torus with one boundary component, non-separating. There it is, okay? I'm taking the mod s orbit of that, so, okay. <clears throat> okay, so the characterization that we give of this idea of sufficient richness is going to be given in terms of what I'll call surface combinatorics, and I'll say precisely what I mean in a minute. Um, but we can further characterize by what McCarthy and Papadopoulos called exchange automorphism. So the idea, is, so McCarthy and Papadopoulos actually found examples uh, of, of, well, counterexamples to Ivanov's meta-conjecture. And the way they did that uh, is by finding uh, two vertices in a complex and saying, hey, look, they have the exact same links. In other words, they're connected to the exact same things and also not connected to the exact same things. And so we can just swap them. And as, and as soon as you can find a pair of vertices like that um, and you can't swap them topologically, then you found a counterexample to Ivanov. So, um, so we're also going to characterize this in terms of exchange automorphisms. So <clears throat> in fact, I'm going to show you when I give you our definition of sufficient richness that it's these surface combinatorics that I'm going to describe are exactly equivalent to this idea of, of exchange automorphism. So as I go through the conditions, um, we'll think about you know, how we could find these pairs of vertices that you can swap. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the there are four parts to this theorem. I want to spend the most time on the first part, and then we'll sort of quickly go through this, the, the other three, because this is really the main idea. So, so the whole point of this theorem is it's supposed to be user-friendly. So you, know, you get your collection of objects that you want to put in the bucket, and we go to the checkout counter, and we just sort of tick, 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 and decide if they meet the criteria. So there's sort of two sets of criteria, one for non-annulus, uh, components and one for, for annuli. So if you have a representative in your set A of something that's not an annulus, then the first condition you have to meet is that every complementary region um, is going to have some representative that's also representing something in your set. Okay? So <clears throat> Here's, uh, sorry Dan, I kept the bow-legged. Uh, so, um, so here's an example of something that fails that. And this is essentially the McCarthy and Papadopoulos construction sort of fixed up a little bit for a closed surface. So if I take pairs of pants embedded in my surface in such a way that one of the complementary regions is an annulus, then what I can just do is take some curve, like this longitudinal curve going around here, and Dane twist, and I'll get another representative of that same object. I'll get another one of these bow-legged pants, but kind of twisted up. And it'll have the exact same intersection pattern with everything else on the surface, okay? So that's going to give me an exchange automorphism that's going to give me a pair of vertices I can swap while fixing everything else. Okay? So, so the main idea of sufficient richness is just that every complementary region on your surface, you have to have something interesting in there that you can kind of grab onto, otherwise things are going to break down. Okay? So, um, so, so this is really the main idea of sufficient richness, if you can keep this picture um, in your mind, then you've got the basic point of sufficient richness. So, I mean, the other, uh, the other three conditions are just kind of more um, housekeeping, really. So, uh, the second condition that you need for non-annular elements is that if there's only one complementary region, so in other words, you were non-separating to begin with, then one of your two regions um, can't just be basically the from the same class under your mod s orbit. So, um, for example, uh, here's, here's something that passes the first condition but fails the second. 
So if you have an even genus surface, um, you could have basically half the surface here. Uh, and then the other half of the surface technically passes condition one, but you just get this little edge in your complex and you can do an exchange automorphism there, okay? Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly the point, right? So I could exchange this region with this region, right? So this, this fails to be sufficiently rich. But I thought that the point is that if, when you can't do it topologically, that you can do it in the complex. That's what I was going to call trouble. Um, so, so, yeah, topologically you can switch these. That's true. That's true. Let me think what goes wrong here. Yeah, so, so you do get, that's true, you can, there is a homeomorphism of this surface that takes this vertex to this vertex. That is true. Oh, that's the, yeah, sorry, 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 yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, so the point, right, so the point is your mapping class group is acting on everything and the exchange automorphism is just, is fixing everything besides your pair, right? So yeah, you can, you can swap these two, but other things are going to move at the same time. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, for annuli, it's more or less the same idea. So um, you want to have something in your complementary region that's homotopically distinct, so I bas basically thinking of a torus here, um, uh, or something like uh, this where you have um, basically the annulus version of the previous picture. So here, uh, if I make a complex out of uh, separating annuli that cut the surface in half, I'm just going to get a discrete complex and uh, not terribly interesting anyway. So. Uh, the second condition on annuli, again, um, just, just things like, you know, swapping uh, this genus uh, the, or this torus with one boundary component with its boundary component, things like that you want to rule out, okay? So, but the point is, like, you just, you have your list of objects, like genus one separating curves and non-separating tori with one boundary component, you just go through the list and, you know, you're done. Okay so, okay, so we know some examples of sufficiently rich sets, okay? So the complex of curves, where we take A to be all annuli, that's sufficiently rich if genus is at least two. The complex of separating curves, okay? So this is another example. Um, the complex of domains, where I take everything. Now this works as long as the surface is closed. McCarthy and Papadopoulos gave a counterexample um, when you have at least two boundary components uh, in the complex of domain case. But I can start just doing random stuff now, right? I can just take, um, so I can just take my separating curves of genus five. So this is the example that I cooked up. And what did I take? Non-separating genus two surfaces with six boundary components, okay? And I'm gonna say something about where the genus comes from in a minute, but I can guarantee you that if I'm on a surface of genus at least 16, then this is going to work, okay? So, um, you know, th this is the idea. It's just kind of, you know, you do your shopping and you check out and you, you find a genus where you're going to have this result, okay? So, so now we get to the, the second uh, part of the theorem that I need to quantify. So, if you, so what does it mean to, to have a big enough surface? How do we get to that genus 16, in other words? So we introduced something that um, we've been calling the enveloping genus of a surface. And so the idea is if you have a representative object, you want to stick it into some subsurface of, of your surface that is non-separating and in particular one boundary component, okay? So and if you have a subset, a collection of these, then you just take the smallest one out of all the ones you have. So, and here's just a note that, you know, we can, we can do similar definitions for things like multi-curves or 
unions of subsurfaces. So technically my regions are all connected, so that's why I'm mentioning that here. So, I mean, examples, so if you think about a non-separating uh, annulus, right, the smallest, uh, gen the smallest genus subsurface that you can stick that into is obviously genus one, right? And if I have uh, a separating curve of genus K, so that just means take the smaller of the two sub, uh, uh, genera that you, you cut the surface into, and so the smallest subsurface that we can stick that into has genus K. Okay, sort of. So, so the enveloping genus, you can sort of think of this as maybe generalizing the idea of the genus of a separating curve if you want to. But um, here's a slightly more interesting example. So here's my, this is the, the example I cooked up before. So I have a genus two subsurface with six boundary components. And so what's this enveloping genus? Well, I'm just going to you know, do that, basically. And you can see I can get a little formula if I wanted to. So it's just going to be uh, two genera here plus six, uh, and then minus one because I capped off. So it's going to have enveloping genus seven. OK? Everybody happy with that? OK. So. Um, now I can give you the precise version of the theorem that we proved. So if you fix a subset uh, of the construction that we described, and if I take genus at least three times the enveloping genus of my set, now remember that means I take the minimum over all the elements in A plus one, then the natural map is an isomorphism if and only if the set A that you started with meets this sufficient richness criteria. Okay, and um, <clears throat> so this map is, it turns out it's always injective, okay? So injectivity is not the hard part. Um, it's, it's surjectivity where the work comes from, all right? And I should mention here, this is why I put this in. So our lower bound on genus is far from sharp. So if there's anybody sort of really keen to improve on this, there's certainly room for that. So you'll notice, for example, that um, you know, for, for the curve complex, our enveloping genus is 1. So we get a lower bound of 4, but we know that the curve complex um, uh, gives us an isomorphism here um, uh, for, for, for lower genus than that. So definitely not a sharp bound. <clears throat> OK, so I just want to tell you a little bit um, in the time that's left about some of the, the key ideas that go into this. All right, so, so we have this idea of a dividing set. So somehow we needed to pass between things like that, that uh, genus two surface with six boundary components and, and curves, because curves are what we know how to handle um, in this context, right? We have Ivanov's theorem. So as, a, as one part of that procedure, we're going to take what we call dividing sets. And these are just multi-curves that divide our surface into exactly two pieces. So we're just generalizing the idea of a separating curve here, OK? And I'm going to play the same game where I could take mapping class group orbits of these guys and make a set out of them. And so I can sort of redo all the definitions that I've done before. But we need a better notion of disjointness, OK? So we want to, so the problem with dividing sets is, I mean, so we want them to be nested, like in this picture. So this is, this is the kind of disjointness that we want. I mean, we obviously want to rule out actual intersection. But we also want to rule out sort of moral intersection, right? <laughs> So, I mean, these guys are technically disjoint, but they've kind of linked together, and we don't want to allow that, all right? So, so the edges in the complexes that we're going to make out of dividing sets correspond to nesting, okay? And how we relate this to the set A that we started with is this, we've been sort of calling it the boundary of A. I'm not quite sure that's really the best term for it. But um, the idea is that you want to take dividing sets 
that have elements of the set you started with on both sides, okay? And, and, and we, can, uh, do, we, can, we can do this for dividing sets as well. Um, so where the name comes from is that if you have a non-separating region, like this guy, our favorite example of the talk, um, its actual boundary is going to be an element of delta A because you have on one side, well, the element that you started with, but if you're sufficiently rich, then you have room to fit another guy in on the other side as well, okay? So actual boundary elements are always going to be in delta A, and that's where the name comes from. But you can also have just kind of silly examples like the one on this slide. So this multi-curve, uh, you know, is also in delta A for any A that contains genus one um, separating curves, right? Because I can fit them in there. So it doesn't always have to be an actual boundary for your set. Just you need room on each side. Okay. So the other, uh, or another tool that we had to employ for, for this proof was uh, looking at generalizations of the complex of separating curves. So what, what you do here, so you can think of the complex of separating curves as the complex of separating curves of genus at least one. So why not take the complex of separating curves of genus at least two or five or ten, okay? So that's what C k of s is. So in this context, C1 is C sep. And so one of the, the theorems along the way that we proved is that as long as you're in the case where your genus is at least 3k plus 1, then the natural map you get here is going to be an isomorphism. Okay. And I'll say something about the proof uh, in a moment. <clears throat> so we have a similar result for dividing sets. So we have this technical condition that if you, if you form this delta uh, of D, you, you actually get back D again. So you have some collection of dividing sets, um, and you take its boundary and then nothing happens. So the, the key point here is that if you're sufficiently rich, this always happens, okay? So this applies in the context that we're interested in. And then we get this analogous result here. So as long as we're at least three times the enveloping genus of your dividing sets plus one, um, then you win, okay? So how do we prove the main theorem? So here's a sort of heuristic sketch for us. Okay, so we start with the complex uh, associated to the set A that we chose. So again, we're thinking just, you know, one of those random examples like genus 5 separating curves and genus 2 non-separating curves with six boundary components, whatever it is. And so <clears throat> we associate to that a complex uh, built out of these boundaries of of A. So in other words, we're now looking at dividing sets that have elements of A on both sides. We make our complex. And from that, we get to some complex of separating curves. And from that complex of separating curves, we sort of bootstrap our way down to the complex of separating curves, and from there to the complex of curves and from there to the mapping class group. And how do we do this? Well, there's a technical proposition that I haven't really told you about yet that lets us do step one. Um, the theorem that I just told you about lets us do step two. That's what basically takes us from a complex built out of multi-curves to a complex built out of separating curves. And then we have the theorem about separating curves uh, that takes us down to the case of, of all separating curves. And then there's a theorem uh, that Dan and I proved uh, 11 years ago, apparently. Um, <laughs> right, um, happy birthday, Dan. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, this is telling us that every automorphism of the separating curve complex gives you an automorphism of the full curve complex, 
And then in the spirit of Ivanov's meta conjecture, you invoke Ivanov and you're done. Okay? So this is the rough outline of the proof. And um, <clears throat> let me just tell you a few of the ideas involved in, in some, of these, some of these proofs, the, the three first ones here. Okay? So for theorem A, so this was the one that tells us that um, as long as uh, the genus is at least 3K plus 1, we get um, an automorphism, we get, we get uh, that automorphisms of the separating curve complex of genus at least K is the mapping class group. So here we're um, extending an idea that we used from this, the, uh, the case of the separating curve complex uh, from way back when. So the basic idea was this. So you have two genus one separating curves. Um, and you know what happens to them. So you want to say what happens now to non-separating curves. Okay? So, um, so you can form a configuration like this that's sort of grabbing onto this, uh, this non-separating curve, which I've labeled C. So I think of that as a genus zero curve in this analogy here. And we, we said that uh, these two curves, A and B, share that uh, curve C. It's called these sharing pairs. And what we showed was that if you have an automorphism of the separating curve complex and one of these sharing pairs, then that automorphism preserves that sharing pair configuration. So in other words, um, phi of A and phi of B are also going to share some curve and that that's uniquely determined. So this is what gives you the uh, isomorphism uh, to the automorphism group of the full curve complex. So this is what allowed us to pass from C sep to the full complex of curves. So we have to just basically ramp that idea up and start with a genus K curve. So here K is 3. And find two curves of one genus higher that share that curve. So here's the picture. Um, you know, I can take this green curve and this pink curve, and they sort of cut off this lower genus curve. And this allows you to go from the complex of uh, separating curves of genus K plus 1 to 1 lower. And so, so, yeah, I mean, they do. So you have to, you have to be careful here. It's, it's a lot of details I'm sweeping under the rug here. Yeah, so I mean, so, so there's a lot of work that goes in, in, into showing that this is all well-defined. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, we, we have the high genus bound, right? So we have big surfaces um, to work with. So we have to show that every, like, you can tell which side things are on and um, all of that. OK. So you're right, there are some issues there. OK, so um, I think I'm going to skip over this for now. So I'll just say theorem B, um, uh, this, there, there's a lot that goes in here. Um, Basically, well, maybe I'll just say sort of the key point is that, so this is the theorem that tells you how to get from dividing sets to separating curve complexes. And the, the key point is that if you have a dividing set or a collection of dividing sets and their mapping class group orbits, then you can take their enveloping genus, and that gives you a number. And uh, so, that is going to be, a, so separating curves of that genus is, uh, are going to span a subcomplex of your dividing set complex, and it's going to be characteristic in that subcomplex. So in other words, preserved by any automorphism. So this gives you a way to get from complexes of multi-curves to complexes of separating curves. So let me just skip through this. Um, and along those same lines, uh, <coughs> So one of, the, one of the key tools that we have is this idea of sort of a core of a sufficiently rich set. So if you take um, basically 
the set of all elements that have exactly one complementary region that has something in A uh, and that are minimum with respect to partial ordering, um, then, then this gives you a subset of your, of your set A that you started with and somehow everything you need to know about A is contained in this core. So um, I'll, I'm just going to skip over some of the details here, but just to give you an idea of, of how this, this last piece of, of the sketch, the heuristic diagram goes. Okay, that can't be good. Um, I had to break down at some point. Um, okay, not sure what's going on with the slide here, but basically the, the point is that you start with an automorphism of A, and that's supposed to be C sub A naught there. Uh, so the point is that your automorphism induces an automorphism of this, this core, and it's going to be characteristic in, in there, okay? And from there, you get to an automorphism of this, the boundary of this core. And from there, you get to a mapping class. And then you just pull yourself back. Okay, so, so again, um, I should say that, uh, for example, step two doesn't actually use sufficient richness. But we're using sufficient richness pretty heavily everywhere else in this technical proposition. So this is really the sufficient richness is really uh, coming into play very heavily here. Um, if you actually, if you don't have sufficient richness, <coughs> is it there like all your like Yeah, it's an if and only if, right? right. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's exactly the condition you need. And so, I mean, personally, I kind of like this sort of topological characterization of it, but the exchange automorphism condition is also equivalent to this. So, so McCarthy uh, and Papadopoulos were sort of the first ones to look at these exchange automorphisms, and the obstruction that they found is the unique obstruction. That's, that's what it is. I, I think that's a good place to stop, so thank you very much. Okay. So, so, um, right. So, so, edge, so, so, no, because we're built in. So, so the thing is, well, you could probably. I think there are a lot of examples of complexes that don't fit into the framework that we have specifically set up here, but I think these methods could be adapted. But right now, I think the answer is no, because our rule for uh, putting an edge between things that are complex is disjointness. Yeah, exactly. Like that, I mean, yeah, they come, right, the, right. I mean, these things come up all the time. I think, I mean, honestly, I think that this maybe is just sort of a prototype theorem and you could expand this to a lot of the other complexes. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that would be, that would be a good thing for, for somebody to work on to try to expand this to, I mean, some of the other, I mean, this, this covers a lot of the complexes that arise in nature but it certainly doesn't cover all of them. But I do think that the methods could be adapted. It's just, it, it's, um, you know, writing it up has been very sort of technical. And so we are, I think at this point, cutting the cord here. But I think <laughs> there's, there's a lot more that you could do along these lines that would incorporate some of these other complexes. Yeah. Yeah, so like the Torelli, you know, so like bounding pairs, yeah. So I, I, think, I think that's another natural generalization, absolutely.